Now our next guest uh, believes in the words, your work is what defines you. She's currently working on her master's degree in zoology, uh, but has also won an award for Dua, her short film at the Yes I Am The Change Film Festival. And she also is a freelance content writer and someday hopes to make a difference through science communication. So please give a very well welcome to Priyanka Dasgupta. Such wonderful performances before me. I'm a bit nervous. I hope I don't faint and fall. Good thing though, I brought this helmet along to protect my precious little brain from head injuries. Just like this helmet, there are clever little soldiers called the immune cells in our body trying to protect us from disease. But sometimes these defense lines are breached. Say a bacteria comes in ever so slyly and knock this helmet off. And our body, unable to protect itself, succumbs to disease. At which point, it needs the help of medicinal drugs. Today it is very easy. We know a lot about diseases and hence are able to prevent them. But have you ever wondered what it was like back in the day? Let's try to find out. So let's step into this time machine here and take a trip back to the late 19th century. The strategy for tackling diseases at the time was to attack the symptom. So say this region in my hand here has been diseased. So my approach would be to bombard it with drugs and toxic substances like mercury, which would be harmful to my body as well. And pray to God that in all the destruction that is happening, the disease gets eliminated as well. Such a chance. But in the early 1900s, as people started realizing that diseases could be caused by germs, Paul Elric, a German scientist, had an idea. He proclaimed the need for new drugs that would act not like explosives destroying everything in its vicinity, but like bullets, smart and efficient, killing only the person they're meant for. This simple shift in strategy changed the face of medicinal history. Elric got the idea from chemical dyes he knew were used to target certain organs specifically. He thought that the same could be done with drugs as well. And he started tinkering with compounds in his labs, trying to synthesize a drug that would target the disease specifically and leave our innocent cells alone. So he started trying. He tried and tried and seemed to fail. Then he tried some more. And the 606 compound he tested was found effective. He had found the first magic bullet. The magic bullet theory which went on to become the foundation for something that is today widely known as chemotherapy, which still remains one of the most widespread treatments for cancer. So next time when you suck at a problem, remember this and keep listening for those simple ideas because sometimes the solution to the toughest of problems is simply a shift in perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and this idea of the, the, the magic bullet and chemotherapy. Um, I, of course, I'm not an expert in this, but some of it works and some of it doesn't. So the concept and the theory of the magic bullet may, may be there, but how many real magic bullets are there and how are they working? And where are they? Uh, the magic bullet that I currently talked about was uh, an azobenzoate compound that was later marketed as Salversan 606, which was at the time used to treat syphilis. Of course, it was not, that if, it was not the best way to treat syphilis at the time, but it developed. The point that I'm trying to make here is the things are there and we are scientists born to discover those. There might be things that might not be the best solutions, but we have to start somewhere. And that foundation, that actually laid the foundation for trying to look at it in a different way. Before this, we were treating it with things like immunological responses. It was a, it was a new discovery at that time as well. And um, chemical compounds were being used, but targeting something was the first step towards discovering greater things. And that is what I think I'm 
wanting to set across to the public that we want people to start looking at the problem and as they progress, we start discovering better things. Uh, one question about the presentation. How come uh, you just thought it fit only to do the helmet as the thing and nothing else, like not a bullet or not? Uh, um, I mean, uh, in terms of props, how come just one, one this thing and nothing more? I got that, and I got a bit more nervous when I started seeing all the great props that they've made use of. But uh, I thought that sometimes when you need to get the message across, Overdoing it might distract the audience. That is something that I believe because when the idea is crisp, I need to get the idea across. And I hope you all got that, that we need, start, we need to start getting a different perspective. And props, I think they're an intelligent enough audience to have understood it by my perspective of the topic that I explained. Of course, the presentations that they gave, props were necessary. But I thought that this was quite a lot for this one. had the same problem as uh, she had. Chemotherapy is still a problem with attacks. Yeah, uh, I got the, I understand that, that chemotherapy is still. So though, though we got the idea in terms of uh, the, the scientific endeavor and yeah. the hard work that it uh, takes, that idea came across well. But the other part of the content somehow got. Uh, I got confused. that, but uh, I, w I agree with you, of course, on the fact that it is definitely not the best solution that works right now, but I just wanted to point out the significance of this discovery and uh, show, th I want to just personify this discovery as something that can be embodied into some, some other fields as well. That sometimes the little things that might not work can just give you the spirit to move on and discover something that might be the best things. Thank you very much. Awesome. Yes,